Welcome and good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to the alumni, parents, Brandeis National Committee members, and friends around the world who have registered for this event. My name is Joyce Antler. I'm Professor Emerita of American Studies at Brandeis, and I'm a proud member of Brandeis class of 1963. I'd like to thank first the co-sponsors of this program, the Brandeis University Press, the Brandeis Alumni Association, the Brandeis National Committee, the Brandeis OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute, which we call Bali, and the American Studies Program. One logistical note before we begin our conversation, there will be some time for Q&A at the conclusion of the program. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. And you can also share a memory of Brandeis if you'd like, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Our two speakers tonight are extremely illustrious teachers and scholars, and I'll have time to share only a few highlights of their distinguished intellectual biographies, and then I'll turn the discussion over to them. First, my colleague, Steve Whitfield. Steve is the Max Richter Professor of American Civilization Emeritus at Brandeis. He received his BA at Tulane, his master's at Yale, and his PhD at Brandeis in 1972. Fortunately for us, he stayed teaching in the American Studies Department for some 43 years. His courses on individualism, the culture of the Cold War, journalism, transatlantic crossings, and many others were treasured staples of our program, as was Steve himself. In 1993, Steve received the Louis D. Brandeis Prize for Excellence in Teaching at the University. In 2008, students honored him with the Brandeis Student Union Teaching Award. Steve also held numerous distinguished lectureships abroad. Steve has an outstanding publishing record as well, authoring nine highly acclaimed books and dozens of articles, including numerous pieces on Southern history and on American Jewish history. In addition to the book we're going to discuss tonight, Learning on the Left, his other books include A Death in the Delta, The Story of Emma Till, Into the Dark, Hannah Arendt, and Totalitarianism, American Space, Jewish Time, and In Search of American Jewish Culture. Julian Zelitza is the Malcolm Stevenson Forbes Class of 1941 Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University. Julian received his BA from Brandeis in 1991, and I remember him very well as an outstanding student of history, as he was. He received his MA and PhD from John Hopkins University. Julian is the author and editor of 21 books on American political history, including most recently published in July, Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker, and The Rise of the New Republican Party, I only have a minute to name a few of his other books, uh, Taxing America, William D. Mills, Congress and the State, 1945 to 1975, which won the Ellis Holy Prize for Best Book on Political History and the D.B. Hardiman Prize for the Best Book on Congress. And another book is The Fierce Urgency of Now, Lyndon Johnson, Congress and the Battle for the Great Society, which also won the Hardiman Prize. Julian is the frequent media commentator and has published more than 900 op-eds, including his weekly column on CNN.com. He's not only prolific, but he's visionary and is widely recognized as one of the foremost pioneers in the revival of the new political history. We are delighted to have both Steve and Julian here tonight for a conversation about Steve's wonderful new book, Learning on the Left, Political Profiles of Brandeis University, I know we're in for a major treat, so let me now turn to Julian to start the conversation. And welcome, welcome. Thank you, thanks so much for that kind uh, introduction uh, and for having me as part of this. Uh, I don't think I have seen you, Joyce, since I took your class many, you. many, many years ago now, but I remember- We were both very young. <laughs> right, but I remember it well. Um, and, and it's really a privilege to talk about Steve's new book. 
uh, which is it's also terrific. Uh, not only are you a great scholar, but uh, you loomed large at the university. And this book in particular, you found an interesting way to write the history of an institution, which is not always easy. Um, that, that really has great substance, great stories, and a great argument to tell about the importance of this university. I'll just before uh, jumping into this, uh, I really, uh, my uh, experience at Brandeis was tremendously important in my career. Uh, and there were many parts of being there that I remember well. Uh, but one of them was learning about the liberal and progressive tradition in, in American uh, history. It was certainly integral still to the student culture and certainly to the curriculum. So when you sent me uh, this invitation, I couldn't resist, uh, especially after having a chance to see the book. So thank you uh, for having me. And maybe we can just start for everyone with the, the basic question of you know, why you decided to write the book, how this project came together. Yeah, thank you, Julian. And again, I'm grateful. Uh, I share that gratitude with Joyce and the sponsors that you're participating in this conversation. Uh, the, the book has a kind of genesis, perhaps quite fittingly, with a, uh, a readings course that I had with Rachel LeBeau in, of the class of 2004. I say it's fitting in part because the book itself is dedicated to the students uh, whom I was very privileged and very lucky to be able to know and to meet. And uh, therefore, the book has its origin really in an independent study in which uh, Rachel and I basically looked at printed works that dealt with Brandeis, how it was portrayed. It could be in a novel such as Alan Lelchuk's American Mischief, which is set in a, uh, a campus west of Boston. The name of the campus in the novel is called Cardozo College. Um, and uh, we looked at Abe Sacker's memoir, A Host at Last, which is the most indispensable book, I think, on the early years of Brandeis University. We looked at a number of articles, and in the aftermath of that, of that course, uh, I realized that there is a lot more material here that might be able to uh, uh, become available for something that was beyond the readings course itself, which was not particularly oriented toward politics. But I realized that if there's anything that could be said to be distinctive about Brandeis, and there are other ways in which it can be considered, it's exactly what you referred to in your own opening remarks, Julian, which is to say it needed to be embedded within the liberal tradition, its particular pluses and minuses, its particular changes and revisions over time. And I think that that uh, is an angle that nobody had really uh, considered. And the hypothesis that I started with was that Brandeis, in terms of its faculty and its alumni, uh, whether they were activists, whether they were writers, whether they were thinkers, really played a very disproportionate role in American civic life. So that was the uh, impetus, that, and that's the, that's the thesis of the book itself. And I want to move into some specific people who you write about, but I'll, I know many people watching know this, but I'll still ask it anyway. Can you just uh, kind of briefly remind us of the origins of Brandeis University and what what its founding mission was in the early decade or so. Yeah, of course it started, as all the alumni know, it started in 1948, of course, in the aftermath of the Second World War and the aftermath of the Holocaust. Uh, and it was designed at, in part as a place of refuge in an era in which anti-Semitism was in all sorts of ways taken for granted. It was designed as a place where faculty, including refugees from, uh, from the Third Reich, could have a place in academe, a place where students who were Jews, but who were ambitious and able and qualified and promising, might not be able to get places at the most prestigious and most competitive institutions of higher learning. So it began, in a sense, as a kind of resistance to the very forces of discrimination and prejudice against which liberalism was intended, to, um, uh, was intended to oppose. So its beginnings really are within the, the broader context, ideological context of the left, of progressivism more broadly. And it was intended really to be a kind of rebuttal to all those barriers of discrimination and prejudice that existed 
primarily in, in academe in the 1940s and certainly much earlier. Do you think, just to pick up on that, uh, the relationship between anti-Semitism, especially in the aftermath of World War II, and an attachment or nurturing of progressive ideas, um, was, was this an imp uh, kind of, this is an important relationship. It's not always recognized, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, in an odd way, I think it was taken for granted that um, if, uh, if you thought that there was something about anti-Semitism anti that needed to be remedied and resisted, you were almost always going to be uh, on the left. Anti-Semitism was then believed to be simply an expression of privilege, um, of hierarchical or ancestral um, uh, power. And um, therefore, those who wish to oppose prejudice, not, of course, only confined to anti-Semitism, were, I would say, almost always, uh, within the, broadly speaking, the progressive or liberal tradition. And it was basically taken for granted. I mean, the typical speakers who came to Brandeis, the typical uh, commencement speakers, were almost always liberal Democrats well into uh, two decades later. And it was something that was simply a, a kind of common assumption that was related very much to the mission of the university itself. So this was something self-conscious with the administration. And <laughs> I mean, was it we are not only a secular Jewish university, uh, but also one that will be committed to this set of political ideas? I mean, is that the sense you got from the history? Well, it's, it's tricky. I think uh, Abram Sacker himself was not, um, uh, politically um, uh, particularly well-defined. I think he was certainly broadly speaking liberal. Mm -hmm. It came to students doing much of the, in the form of off-campus uh, opposition to uh, the violation of civil rights. He was certainly supportive and sympathetic, but I don't think he had a particularly pronounced political profile, but he was certainly, I would say, from what my understanding is, there may be alumni who will disagree, he was certainly broadly sympathetic, sympathetic to those general aims. He was very much admirer of Justice Brandeis, whom he met on a couple of occasions. Um, and um, uh, in that sense, I believe the, the atmosphere, the ethos, even if it was not rendered explicit, was certainly within that, broadly speaking, that liberal tradition. And so then you uh, develop a book revolving around people at the university, and, and that's the structure, uh, different personalities who are here. How did you choose and decide who to highlight and uh, who, who shouldn't be highlighted? How, how did you put together uh, the, the chapters of this book? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful question because uh, it allows me to say that it's not really, strictly speaking, an institutional history. Um, I don't make any such claim. There is the need for an institutional history. It's basically about the politics of the people who taught here or were students here, who then went on to important careers, or perhaps they came to Brandeis having already established themselves, in the case of the faculty, with such careers. So the, the criterion, broadly speaking, I would say, would be, uh, would be prominence and importance. Uh, so that uh, to pick, you know, a couple of the obvious examples, Herbert Marcuse obviously has to be included in such a book. He was the most famous of the full-time tenured faculty members in the first two decades near the end of his career. He left Brandeis in 1965. The only member of the Brandeis faculty ever to be denounced by name by the Vatican by uh, Pope Paul VI. Uh, so he clearly has to be in the book. Um, his most uh, celebrated student, Angela Davis of the class of 1965, obviously also has to be included in the book. Uh, figures uh, like Abby Hoffman, figures like Irving Howe and uh, Louis Kozer and Philip Rav, all of whom had careers associated with political life often before the formation of Brandeis, or even before they came to Brandeis. They were sort of obvious choices. And um, I would say virtually anybody whose career could be easily tracked. And then there were thinkers, uh, thinking particularly of people like Michael Walzer of the class of uh, 1956, Michael Sandel of the class of 1975, 
who had truly distinguished careers in the field of political thought, political philosophy. Uh, many of these choices, it seems to me, um, uh, were, were obvious and wrote themselves into, into the book that I wrote. And uh, Marcuse, for, for everyone, uh, kind of who was he and what was his story at Brandeis? Yeah, well, he, this was a remarkable story because he was basically unknown till he came to Brandeis. Uh, he was a, among the figures in the Frankfurt School, the School of Critical Theory, that sought to revive Marxism in the wake of the view that the labor movement um, had failed in its particular historical uh, scenario and that other efforts had to be found in order to radically transform Western industrialized society. So he was a key thinker in that, but he also drew upon Freudian theory, most famously in his 1955 book, Eros and Civilization, in my view, his best book, uh, but then became famous for One Dimensional Man in 1964, uh, which made him an international figure so that, um, uh, for example, radical students in Rome uh, would carry placards that said Marx, Mao, Marcuse. Uh, and there's been never a, a Brandeis faculty member full time that ever had that particular sort of recognition. He leaves in 1965 to go to the University of California, San Diego. His scholarly career is over by then. And the radical movement itself uh, was to crest only a few years later and then his own reputation would begin to sink. But he was certainly a very significant figure and uh, by all evidence that I was uh, researching, uh, was also able to have a tremendous impact as a teacher. Um, and, and any number of students have testified to the sobriety, the uh, dignity, and the intellectual power that he was able to convey. Another figure who looms large in the book is Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes. Tell us about her time. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Eleanor Roosevelt probably uh, deserves to be credit, credited for putting Brandeis University on the map in the way that nobody else did. The first, um, the first woman to serve on the Brandeis Board of Trustees, uh, the most admired woman in the world uh, in the final years of her life, according to the Gallup poll, uh, somebody who um, had a genuine appreciation for the mission of Brandeis in terms of its liberalism. Uh, she was, of course, while first lady and then after her husband's death, was an iconic figure in the Democratic Party and in, uh, and in, the, in the fate of American liberalism. So she bestowed her uh, unmatched prestige on the university, delivers a commencement address uh, very early in the career of the university, and uh, with uh, Larry Fuchs, a colleague of mine and a colleague of uh, Joyce Antler's, uh, teaches a course on international organization and law for three years um, on, at the university. And um, uh, really in virtually every imaginable way that she was called upon as a teacher, as a trustee, as somebody who could help President Sacker raise money, uh, she was an utterly indispensable figure and um, crucial really to the early history of the university. Was someone, do you think, like Abby Hoffman, uh, who's one of the, for undergraduates, at least when I was there, he was one of the uh, coolest uh, alumni to have. Um, was his, I mean, do you sense that he was shaped by his time there? Or was he, uh, you know, someone on the left who happened to go to Brandeis? What's the relationship? Yeah, it's, it's a curious case. The, the section of the book that I write about Abby Hoffman uh, seeks to make the case that he was one of the rare products of the 1960s uh, in the radical movement who basically maintained in a remarkably steadfast way his own particular convictions and his own particular values. When he was at Brandeis, he was not particularly political. Um, and he loved Brandeis actually for academic reasons. Uh, the faculty he thought was absolutely phenomenal. He was very much, uh, very much cherished the three M's, that is Marcuse, the psychologist uh, Abraham Maslow, and the historian Frank Manuel. And Abby Hoffman's um, autobiography, which is called Soon to be, made a, soon to be a Mo Major Motion Picture, um, pays a wonderfully glowing tribute uh, to his undergraduate experience, basically on academic terms before he later turns uh, into a, the political figure that he became. 
And uh, Angela Davis, who you mentioned, um, what was her experience at? Well, that's again a curious, yeah, that's a curious one. I, I paired um, Hoffman and Davis together as homegrown radicals. Davis, uh, although she came from a, uh, a, a left-wing background in Birmingham, um, was not particularly political as I understand it uh, during her years at Brandeis. She graduated in 1965. I should add here a little bit parenthetically, Julian, uh, as I know you noticed that I kept myself entirely out of the book, although I've learned certain things from faculty members and from former students that I think shaped some of the interpretations. Uh, and Murray Sachs, who, uh, whose field was French literature, told me that uh, Angela Davis was the best student in French literature whom he ever, whom he ever knew. Uh, so she, her career was in that sense, something that was post Brandeis in terms of her own move toward uh, the Black Panthers, toward the Communist Party. All of that is after Brandeis itself. Um, but uh, when she spoke uh, at the Brandeis campus, she returned here about uh, four years ago. She, um, uh, she did pay tribute to what she learned at Brandeis. And is there a figure uh, that you wrote about uh, who stood out to you as someone maybe you didn't know as much about or you hadn't treated as seriously just in your knowledge that as a result of writing the book really now yeah. the more important player? Yeah, it's a great question because the word learning in the title is also a kind of hint as to how much the author learned. Uh, and it's one of the things I think uh, that's wonderful about historical research is that you don't know where it's going to go. You don't know what discoveries you would make. So in, in the case of a uh, philosopher named Jean van Heyenort, whom I had never heard of when I began the work on this book about eight years ago, this was probably the biggest revelation because he had the remarkable pre-Brandeis career of, uh, of Trotskyism and of being uh, Trotsky's bodyguard, Trotsky's um, amanuensis, in other words, Trotsky relied on him for correspondence uh, during the years in which Trotsky was in exile uh, in France and Norway and Mexico. Uh, in other words, uh, I make the claim in the book that von Heyenort uh, was probably closer to Trotsky for the years of his exile than anyone other than Trotsky's own wife. And um, it's one of, the, uh, one of the sad moments, whatever you think about Trotsky's politics, that, that uh, von Heyenort was not present when a Stalinist assassin came into Trotsky's office uh, outside of Mexico City and murdered him. Uh, von Heyenort always said that had he been there, he would have spotted the fake accent and would have prevented the assassination. So he had an amazingly interesting uh, and very dangerous career uh, within the Trotskyist movement. And then afterwards, and with the, the eclipse of the prestige of Marxism, converted himself into a, um, an important figure in the field of mathematical logic. Uh, and that is what he taught at Brandeis. And, um, it was, uh, it was fascinating for me to discover that particular career. Again, one of the reasons why the book seeks to make the claim that Brandeis was really unusual in a way that one could not imagine any other college or university being. And for those of us who study liberalism and the left, uh, we know it's not a unified movement. There's tons of tensions. It's evolved over time, such as in the 60s. How does it change in, uh, at Brandeis? I mean, do you see those kinds of points of tension? Do you see an evolution that happens in what it means to be of the left? Yeah, uh, this is an, a question to which I know that I will not be able to give justice to. But uh, the claim in the book and the claim that uh, can only be argued forcefully in a more, in a different kind of setting would basically be this that liberalism in 1948, when the university was founded, was based upon the principle that you have to judge people only as individuals. And you should not judge them really by any other criterion but their own personal gifts, their own personal promise. And in the book, particularly in the second chapter, I try to lay out why that version of liberalism was so important. Because when you look at the ways in which talented and promising Jewish academics 
were recommended for jobs or for graduate school. Often the recommenders, in order to do the candidates a favor, would say, well, this candidate is Jewish, but he does not have the traits that you associate with the Jewish people, evidently negative traits. So when you looked at the letters of recommendation, for example, for Abe Mas Maslow in psychology or for Cyrus Gordon in Mediterranean studies, the point was that they are, although they are Jews, they are not like other Jews. They don't have those particular disagreeable traits and therefore judge them as individuals. So that's the, the context under which liberalism comes to make that claim. Brandeis, of course, insists Brandeis, Brandeis insists that there will be no uh, criterion other than individual merit in order to judge candidates for admission or for, um, uh, or for hiring on the faculty. That is, we do not discriminate on the basis of race, religion, gender, etc. So that was the definition of liberalism basically until until the 1960s when things change. Um, at Brandeis, the change takes place with the um, takeover uh, by, bl by black students of Ford Hall in January of 1969, with among other claims that particularly that black faculty should be hired to teach black studies, that scholarships should be given specifically to black students. And that is the moment in which liberalism itself is forced to readjust to the notion that people are not only individuals, but that they are also um, uh, associated with collectivities. They are also associated uh, with uh, either ancestral groups or other kinds of groups, which is part of their identity, part of their sensibility, part of their being. And therefore, liberalism ever since then, ever since the end of the 1960s, has to adjust and to revise itself to take account of the claims that people are not only individuals and that their talents, but also the discrimination that they have, may have faced, the barriers that they might have had to transcend, these should also be taken into account in judging uh, candidates for admission or in judging candidates for, uh, for employment. And that's really the story, it seems to me, as I tried to suggest it, that's the story of the way in which liberalism itself um, uh, becomes altered in the course of the 72 years that Brandeis has been in existence. What, a, what kind of impact, and I wanna, I'm, I'm cognizant of time for questions, but I was there in the late 80s and 90s, and I remember certainly in the student body, there was a much uh, more vocal presence of conservative students who were coming of age in the Reagan revolution. I assume that's expanded uh, since then. How has that affected uh, liberal ideas and uh, liberal faculty and the culture that you've described? How did, how did that impact it as we've seen in other parts of the country? Yeah, uh, it's a tough one to answer, I would think, uh, in, in broad terms. The striking thing, it seems to be in the early years, well before you got there, would be that there were very few conservatives, very few Republicans. But um, the book shows, uh, just to look at it at the microscopic level, the book shows the way in which the left also turned to extremism and turned to violence. Uh, and unfortunately, some Brandeis uh, students were very much involved in that, depicted in the book. And that inevitably and um, quite rightly produced a reaction, a revulsion, uh, and it inevitably produced, it seems to me, a turn to the right. Um, so that the story of America, American politics, which of course you know much better and more authoritatively than I do, is really a turn in which that becomes a way of reshaping the very contours of American politics. Brandeis was inevitably to be affected by that. Uh, and I think the, the tendency, and you can judge in the, in the light of your own experience, the tendency would be maybe less that uh, students turn to the right as they may become increasingly apolitical. So I don't think there was a, a notably uh, emphatic conservatism near the end of the 20th century, so much as there's an important uh, con conservative component, but there's also something in which students uh, are interested in other things besides the politics 
that I think generated so much excitement in the early years. And do you think the left, the, this tradition of the left, uh, certainly with the, the, think the faculty of the university and visiting scholars, um, has, is there a relationship between that and the educational content? I mean, uh, have those values infused the education in any way? Uh, I think there are possibly two answers to that. One would be my own uh, private complaint for many, many of the years that I taught at Brandeis that I'd wish there had been some uh, serious, sophistic a lot of serious, sophisticated conservative students, or at least some, to generate argument, to generate discussion, uh, and if need be, simply to strengthen the, the liberal position in class discussions and interpretations. And um, there were never very many such conservative students whom I ever um, encountered or ha had a chance to know. The broader issue, I think, uh, was more important in the early decades. Mm -hmm. I think the progressive tradition, the liberal tradition, was resisting against the culture of the Cold War, resisting against much of the conservatism of the Eisenhower years, uh, the threat that McCarthyism, of course, posed. So therefore, liberal values and radical values by social Democrats like Irving Howe and, um, and Louis Kozer, um, that that kind of teaching or that kind of ideological orientation uh, represented a kind of um, power and a kind of ten tension against some of the dominant conventions of American political life. It doesn't have quite the same um, panache when liberalism itself becomes uh, a dominant feature in the 1960s. And as, as you wrote in uh, the, the Fierce Urgency of Now, in which there's a cer certain moment in which the liberal um, uh, influence the liberal hegemony becomes genuinely a transformative moment. On those occasions, it's better to have a kind of educational resistance rather than simply a kind of conformism. So in that way, I think the, um, uh, the ideal sort of educational environment is some kind of resistance. If the, if the larger tr uh, political tradition is one of conservatism, uh, it's better to have uh, a liberal engagement and so on, uh, and I would say vice versa. But I think Brandeis, um, even in the years in which it became more apolitical, uh, I think Brandeis was still a place in which that kind of tension could be found. And is, so if you, uh, for, for everyone should get this book, by the way. Uh, I mean, I say this to people who are not from Brandeis, but if you went there and you are connected to the university, it's really just a wonderful way to understand the institution without it being an institutional history. Um, it, it's quite good and it's a good read. But in the end, is the tradition uh, of, of the left at Brandeis, is it different than uh, what we would find at Berkeley or Michigan or other universities who also have a strong tradition. Is there something distinct, do you think, about the left at Brandeis? Yeah, I, I try to wrestle with that in the course of the book since the argument depends so heavily upon the singularity of Brandeis University. Certainly, even in the 1950s, you could si find important pockets of that kind of radicalism at Ann Arbor, at Madison, at Berkeley, uh, presumably at City, at City College. Brandeis was different because it was a private uh, institution uh, that uh, sought to um, compete in some ways at least with the more established private liberal arts colleges in New England, which uh, in places like Yale, Dartmouth, um, I would say also uh, uh, Princeton, um, often the students in that era tended to be Republican. So in that sense, Brandeis was different. And then beginning in the 1960s, I think under the impact of the Vietnam War, then other colleges and universities in a sense caught up with Brandeis. So that now Brandeis politically, I'm not arguing in any other way, but that politically Brandeis doesn't uh, differentiate itself all that strikingly from other sorts of particularly liberal arts colleges and, and many of the, um, of the state universities. So in that sense, the political singularity, I think, has differed. But um, I can only recall that in terms of 
the, uh, the sense that there was always at least a kind of political energy or a heightened political consciousness. I can only uh, note what uh, ex-president Sacker used to say when he would meet former students and he would claim that he'd be able to guess what class they had graduated from on the basis of what they were protesting against when they were undergraduates. So there's at least that sense of some kind of dissatisfaction, some rumble of political discontent that I think long characterized the university. Yeah, my first, I mean, I think when I visited the college, the university uh, as a prospective student, I believe it was that visit where the first thing I remember were the protests against apartheid in South Africa. Yeah. And sure. uh, the protesters in the front of you. That was literally my first introduction. <laughs> that experience continues. Um, let me ask, and maybe we can uh, conclude with this before we move sure. to questions. We are in a moment in American history now where there is an energy on the left. Uh, new voices in the left, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement, which is a flourish throughout the country, whether it's the progressive coalition in Congress, such as AOC or the Sanders campaign, will Brandeis uh, continue now, do you think, uh, to be a home for that tradition, or is this a period that we've kind of moved beyond? I'm tempted to answer that, uh, as Joyce introduced me, that uh, I'm an historian and not a prophet. <laughs> so, uh, I use that one all the time. Jodian, I'd rather fudge that, if you don't mind. But before we, we turn it over to Sharon, I'd like to turn the tables on you since this is a conversation. And just to ask you as a kind of final question, given the degree to which Brandeis is mostly associated with outsiders, uh, with people who didn't exercise legislative power, there's only one person who ever became a congressman, Stephen Solars, uh, given the extent to which these were people who were outside looking in, seeking to change the system, and that uh, your scholarship has basically been about insiders, executive branch, legislative branch. Do you have any thoughts about the way in which those sorts of outsiders really altered the trajectory of what was going on inside the Beltway in ways that can be uh, identified? Absolutely. I mean, the, and this is something over the course of my career I've been more interested in. And in some ways, I think it dates back to some of my education at Brandeis. I, the, the book on the Great Society is really uh, a lot about the impact the civil rights movement had on shaking a status quo that didn't want to deal with civil rights or wanted to punt and wait on dealing with civil rights legislation. And movement activists who were seen as quite radical and certainly outside politics were able ultimately to put enough pressure on the system uh, to produce legislation in the mid 60s. I'm now right now writing a book that I'm finishing about uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, the rabbi who in the 60s uh, became a civil rights activist, an anti-war activist. And it's been fascinating to see how he and a group of uh, fellow preachers in the late 60s were part of an anti-war movement that didn't end the war right away but certainly changed the tenor and the temperature of Washington as the 60s progressed. Uh, and the war which started as something that was very popular by the late 60s is not. And you could see how, you know, even a rabbi at, at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and I'm the son of a rabbi, so I, I can say that, uh, could, have, could have an impact. So I believe activists matter, and I believe intellectually too. Uh, I do think the intellectuals who uh, were part of the left, had the ear of the mainstream liberal establishment. Often it's tension, but that tension often produced kind of movement in certain directions on issues like climate change or race relations. So I, I think the left has been extraordinarily important uh, in the mainstream liberal tradition and in Washington, D.C. Uh, that's a nice uh, affirmative note to uh, turn it over to Sharon. Thanks, Julian. Hey, pleasure. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Julian. Um, there are many questions in the Q&A, so we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, the first one, can you address labels of progressive and liberal in so much as these are now being couched as, quote, socialist and as a dirty word in today's polarized climate? 
can you elucidate in the context of modern progressive ideals? And is there hope that these are in fact, quote, American ideals? Is that directed at me? Whichever one of you would like to take that one. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take it very quickly. Uh, at least within the confines of uh, the book called uh, Learning on the Left, it's basically about liberalism, uh, which is defined, broadly speaking, within the immediate historical context of the 1940s and beyond, as a, com as a commitment to civil rights, a commitment to civil liberties, a commitment to international organizations such as the United Nations, um, often an effort to, uh, to limit the power of uh, corporations, um, often a, uh, an expression of support and sympathy for the labor movement. That is what liberalism generally meant in the era of, let's say, the first roughly two decades of Brandeis University, which also included on its uh, faculty and in its student body, people who were to the left associated with social democracy or socialism, uh, and they had no hesitation about using that word, often with the, um, uh, with the uh, qualification, of course, that it meant social democracy, not uh, Bolshevism, not communism, not Trotskyism, uh, later not Maoism, and so on. So if you allow the broader, broader term left to include both radicalism and liberalism, it seems to me it's fairly clear. It becomes a bit more muddled um, uh, over issues of foreign policy. Um, uh, but I, I think that uh, in historical context, it's generally something that can, uh, in which particular political figures can be identified in terms of whether they are liberal, uh, which I, I use as basically a, a synonym for progressive, um, or um, whether they can be defined as, as social democrats. So in, in the immediate context, when you look at actual political figures and political thinkers, it's not that difficult to uh, identify people who satisfy that, those definitions. Okay, thank you. This question is about anti-Semitism. And you mentioned that those fighting anti-Semitism in the early days of Brandeis were mostly liberals. I'm curious what you think of anti-Semitism in 2020. It seems to come from both right and left, and many prominent Democrats have gotten in trouble for anti-Semitic remarks. Does this represent a shift in anti-Semitism? Um, my quick answer would be yes. Uh, it's one of the complications, I think, of 21st century politics, um, uh, that uh, anti-Semitism as historically understood um, as primarily an expression of either a rancid kind of bigotry or simply as the defense of privilege, uh, both associated with either the right or the resentment of groups that felt on the outside, that certainly in recent decades there has been clearly a left anti-Semitism. Um, often, I, I think, and this is a much more complicated subject than it can be do, ju do justice to here, often associated with attitudes toward the state of Israel um, and that um, leftist attitudes toward Israel, especially in recent decades, have indeed often spilled over into something that can be easily identified as anti-Semitism. Thank you. We have a question from a member of the class of 1952. Who, uh -oh. She has not had a chance to read your book yet, but she would like to ask about what you wrote about Max Lerner. And she noted, Max Lerner taught me so much and influenced my effectiveness as a political operative. At age 88, I am still a precinct committee member. <laughs> Terrific. There is a whole section on Max Lerner. I think now is the time for me to admit especially with, uh, with Joyce Antler here, that the book has a certain pronounced American studies bias. Uh, it includes Pauli Murray, it includes Max Lerner, it includes Larry Fuchs, uh, and all three of them uh, were in American studies. And um, Max Lerner was a dominant figure in Brandeis University in the, uh, in the early years. He was a remarkable talent scout, 
Um, it was he who brought people like Louis Kozer and Philip Reef uh, uh, to Brandeis University. He did not um, uh, care particularly about formal credentials. He was a person of extraordinary, um, uh, of extraordinary uh, wide range and versatility. Um, uh, the sort of teacher, the sort of lecturer who um, was able, and perhaps the member of the class of 52 can confirm this, who even when speaking to a room of 200 students, each of those students would feel that he or she was being addressed directly by, by Max Lerner. Um, his career at uh, Brandeis was the most important academic part of his life. Um, he retired in effect in the early 1970s from Brandeis, having basically taught the last few years uh, halftime. Uh, and his, uh, his record at Brandeis was, um, uh, was in, in some ways unmatched, while at the same time having an important career in journalism as a, a columnist for the New York Post and for uh, in syndication. Great, thank you. A question about Albert Einstein. How does your book discuss Einstein's involvement in Brandeis, although he disassociated himself from Brandeis before its actual founding? Yeah. Uh, Einstein plays an important role. I mean, Brandeis relied upon not only the extraordinary prestige of Eleanor Roosevelt in the 1950s, but in the 1940s upon Albert Einstein, the world's most famous scientist, um, who was well aware of anti-Semitism having come from Germany, struck by the degree to which there was an academic anti-Semitism in the US, was very, very supportive of Brandeis University at the very, very beginning. Um, and then um, uh, it got very, very touchy because Einstein was a man of the left um, who felt that, uh, that Brandeis was already at the beginning, beginning to move in a direction of a certain degree of complacency. Um, uh, the fuller account can be found, I believe, in um, in my book, as well as in a number of other books, including books about Einstein. Um, but uh, his um, breakup with the university was abrupt, complete. He refused to uh, even consider accepting an honorary degree, uh, wanted nothing further to do with the university, but he was indeed uh, with the founders at the very beginning. Great, thank you. Brandeis has often been labeled a quote, radical university. Would you agree with that label? And do you think that label has helped or hurt the university? <laughs> the second part is easy. It has certainly hurt. Uh, the first part is, I would say, untrue. We have certainly produced radicals, and we have certainly produced figures who uh, were even associated with violence. Uh, we had four people, uh, four students or former students who made the FBI most wanted list or its equivalent, all of whom incidentally were women, um, but they are unrepresentative of the university, as I tried to suggest earlier in our conversation with Julian, uh, which is to say Brenda, speak, broadly speaking, um, uh, is endowed with a liberal ethos um, that um, um, can feel pressure from the left, pressure from radicalism, but um, except in perhaps the height of the, uh, the anti-war movement in the late 1960s and early 1970s, I think it would be very hard to discern that radicalism was itself the dominant uh, uh, political trait. Yeah, I mean, I, if I could jump in on that, and there was Please. an earlier question about socialism as a label for the left. And, you know, that's a, it's a political, uh, it's a, it's a form of political rhetoric that's often used to, to dismiss a lot of what the left is or liberal ideas, even when it's not a socialist. I think you can think of that uh, with that characterization of Brandeis. I mean, uh, this university, as Steve has talked about, has a, a tradition of, of mainstream liberalism like Eleanor Roosevelt. It has a tradition of uh, leftist uh, politics, and it has a tradition of faculty who are not part of this. I mean, you're highlighting uh, those faculty, um, but, but there's a wide range. Um, but at some level, it's natural. This is a university created 
uh, with not just outsiders, but the perception that it would be a home to those who are not allowed elsewhere. So it's natural that you will nurture a culture and a faculty that at some level uh, pursue those values. That's different than radical. You know, even the late 60s, you could argue the radicals were the ones conducting the war uh, rather than the ones protesting it. And, and so I think I, I tend to shy away from uh, using that label. I think the, the university has a much kind of uh, richer uh, tradition than that. And the tradition of the left isn't always the tradition of the radical as it's probably thought of. Great, thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions in here about Lewis Kozer and asking for more information. Um, <laughs> Lewis Kozer was a professor of, uh, of sociology at Brandeis, the first sociologist whom Brandeis hired, um, a refugee from uh, Nazi Germany, um, who uh, in 1954 with his friend Irving Howe founded the journal of social democratic thought called Dissent, which uh, is now the longest running, the most enduring um, a journal of uh, social democratic thought, or at least uh, democratic radical thought in the English speaking world. It's been around ever since 1954. Um, and Kozer and Howe got the idea while they were at Brandeis. Uh, they wanted to figure out, given the eclipse of the Marxist tradition, they wanted to figure out what is still viable in the definition of democratic socialism that could be defined largely in terms of um, the kinds of comrades that one wants to have in fights in behalf of social justice, fights in behalf of the labor movement, uh, fights in behalf of civil rights and civil liberties, especially during the era of McCarthyism. So Kozer played an important role uh, in the Department of Sociology. Um, an important role in American intellectual and political life with his friend Irving Howe. And uh, Kozer also uh, nourished uh, and encouraged and supported Michael Walzer um, when he was still an undergraduate. Uh, Walzer would be later become a, an editor and a co-editor of Descent Magazine itself. Um, and uh, in that sense, Kozer was am among the key figures in uh, the early years of Brandeis, had various sorts of conflicts with, um, with President Sacker. Uh, Kozer's most famous book was his first called The Function of Social Conflict. And in a sense, he embodied that in many of his uh, struggles with the Brandeis administration. Thank you. Question from a member of the class of 97. He says, listening to Professor Whitfield, one of my favorite professors, brought me right back to my days at Brandeis. I credit Brandeis with my passion for engaging in political and advocacy campaigns, and I am a proud liberal activist. My question, are you seeing any similarities between the 1960s on campus with the current political climate on campus? Uh, I'm gonna have to duck that, although I appreciate the praise. I'm glad you're still an activist and, and an idealist. Uh, I've been retired since uh, December of, 19, uh, of 2016 from teaching. Um, I don't really feel qualified to comment now. I'm sorry. I'm going to jump in. I'm not for brand. I'm not there now, but, but I do think there's some, some, you know, comparison to be made. I think certainly at Princeton, there's a lot of students who are raising some, not just questions about, you know, is a university too conservative or not, but challenging, you know, assumptions we have, uh, questions about how buildings or programs should be named raising questions about the nature of the faculty and the curriculum and asking student-based questions. I mean, uh, kind of a leftist critique of the culture that students are engaged in. And that was an important part of the 60s. It wasn't simply the anti-war movement and it wasn't simply civil rights. It was also what should the university look like? And I don't know, I think there's a lot of that going on right now uh, in the country. It often makes older faculty uncomfortable uh, and, and that's probably a good thing because that means the students are actually raising the kinds of questions that we as faculty ask them to, to do. 
Um, so, so I think there's some interesting comparisons, even if the issues, some of them are, are different. Obviously others, including racial justice, are now sweeping universities uh, as they did in the 60s. Thank you. Another question, what was the administration and board of trustees self-conscious about fostering the activism and scholarship that you write about? And if so, what steps did the leadership take to bring about this agenda? Uh, that's a great question. Um, it's also very difficult to answer because we're talking here about decade after decade in which um, uh, the composition of the administration, the composition of the Board of Trustees was always undergoing change and alteration. You'd have to look at, um, uh, at things that were much more specific. Um, the tricky part here, although it's a wonderful question, is that uh, the book that I wrote is, is very specific in wanting to deal only with the political life of the university, but not even specifically of the university so much as the people who had careers off campus, that it's, it's a kind of extracurricular work rather than something that looks at, uh, at campus issues as such. But even within that, uh, within that warning, I would say it would depend. A trustee like Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, when she spoke and uh, gave, gave the first commencement address to a graduating class, she, uh, in the, which would in 1952, she, um, was obviously advocating a life of what she called adventure, which would have been political idealism and political activism. Uh, Brandeis University had on its board of trustees somebody like Hubert Humphrey, who at least in his early careers in domestic politics was an extraordinary force for civil rights and for human rights. Uh, Stephen Solars was on the board of trustees, a genuinely committed congressman who uh, had much to do with uh, the opposition and the overthrow of tyranny in places like the Philippines. Um, so it's very, very hard to say. You'd have to look also at particular administrations. Um, I mentioned that Sacker was broadly speaking, I would say, as I understand it, I can be corrected here, broadly speaking, sympathetic to uh, at least off-campus activities, broadly speaking, that, uh, that we're aiming at uh, at promotion of social justice. The first president who was to really make social justice an explicit part of the Brandeis mission was Yehuda Reinhardt, uh, to whom I am personally very, very in indebted to his own support for this book. Uh, that's relatively late in the career of Brandeis University, but I think um, that Yehuda was expressing something that at least was implicit in uh, much of the um, uh, much of the support, much of the encouragement that the administration broadly gave. Uh, certainly in the 1960s, and uh, I have a chapter about the civil rights movement in the 1960s in the South, certainly this was something that for which there was as close to universal support, faculty, students, administration, as one could imagine, in the uh, struggle against uh, Jim Crow and against white supremacy in the South. Um, and I think increasingly, even with the Vietnam War, although there would have been differences, uh, the president who succeeded um, uh, Dr. Sacker, that is uh, Morris Abram, was personally and politically against the war in Vietnam. Um, and uh, that was something that was very important in terms of the particular moment in which he served as president. So I'm sure that exceptions could be found. I'm sure there would have to be modifications to this generalization. But I think the, uh, the broader support for social justice is something for which there was at least tremendous uh, implicit support by the administration and by the trustees. Great. Thank you. Um, we're just coming up on nine o'clock on the East Coast and we got a whole lot more questions. So thank you, <laughs> Steve and Julian, for agreeing to, uh, to stick around for a bit longer. Um, another question, what surprised you as you researched and wrote the book? Did it take you somewhere you did not expect to go, especially in how you view political positioning? Uh, wonderful question. Yeah, that's the great uh, joy of research is that you discover things that you couldn't imagine uh, 
were there, that there will always be curiosities, there will be always be oddities and surprises. If there aren't such surprises, you're probably not looking in the right places. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the case of uh, John von Heyenord was probably uh, the biggest surprise to me. Um, the other figure who, of whom I knew nothing before um, embarking on this was, uh, was somebody whom FBI Director Robert Mueller uh, uh, wanted to have captured or killed on the spot. And that is somebody who got her master's degree and her uh, doctorate from Brandeis in neuroscience, uh, Athia Siddiqui, who was now in a federal prison in, um, uh, in Texas, probably for the rest of her life. Uh, and she was somebody who was a kind of embodiment of Islamic terrorism and fundamentalism. I didn't know that she existed. I didn't know that she'd gone to Brandeis as a graduate student, a very successful one, I should add, um, until I started the book. Uh, and then there were just all the sort of little surprises that uh, I feel is among the fun features about history. Uh, just again, I'll give one small example because I'm, I've also been very much interested in the Pentagon Papers, Pentagon Papers case, 1971, and the uh, defense analyst who, um, who leaked the Pentagon Papers, Daniel Ellsberg, uh, uh, not only uh, leaked it to the New York Times and the Washington Post, but also to showed it to uh, the independent, an independent uh, weekly at, uh, in Boston. Uh, which employed uh, Arne Reisman of the class of 1964. And Arne Reisman was actually able to see uh, sections of the Pentagon Papers. And I use that as an example in the book of the, basically the eclipse of authority in the 1960s that uh, ex-President Johnson and President Nixon uh, were able to read the Pentagon Papers only after Arne Reisman did. And uh, that seems to me a remarkable uh, phenomenon. Great, thank you. Um, while there is of course pride in Brandeis being the first and only Jewish sponsored non-sectarian university, there's a certain self-criticism and self-ridicule that we make about the Jewishness of Brandeis that may be part of our cultural personality. With the rise of Black Lives Matter and Kamala Harris's candidacy, we're hearing so much more about historically black colleges and universities and pride in having attended one. Do you see Brandeis as serving the role for Jews as historically black colleges and universities do for the black community? How do you see the Jewish liberal values of Brandeis being celebrated by the Jewish community? Julian, do you want to start that one? Yeah, I mean, look, I would say these are, are very, two very different experiences, and I would be cautious to, to kind of compare these as equivalents. And uh, obviously, the, the history of uh, racial injustice and inequality uh, runs very, very deep uh, in, in our country and continues through this day, whereas the history of anti Semitism has a different dynamic and trajectory. I do think, though, uh, there, I mean, when I, I was here at Brandeis um, during the debate over pork and shellfish uh, being introduced into the Eat Dining Hall, and so that was a question. It raised the question, what does it mean by the 1980s and 90s to be uh, a university with this character? I think this liberal tradition, uh, as it came out of uh, kind of Jewish culture, uh, Jewish theology, uh, is it's an important tradition. Uh, it's not the only tradition. There's a lot of very conservative Jews, but it is a tradition that has lost some of its place in American history. And I think the value of a book like this and the value of remembering that that tradition took form here uh, in an intellectual space, it is important in terms of how the university is distinct. Obviously, American Jews, even with renewed anti-Semitism, still live with pretty good conditions uh, in, in this day and age and don't face the same kind of discrimination, nor do they still need the same kind of institutional base uh, that you have uh, certainly in, in other communities. 
Uh, that said, uh, I think there's ways to talk about what this university has contributed to American society and still does. And this liberal tradition is very important, I think, in American Judaism. And this is a university uh, that is, you know, it's, it's emphasis on this at some level. And it's a great thing about Brandeis. Uh, even a conservative can appreciate this. And it helps fill out what does it mean to be a secular Jewish university in the post-World War II period as anti-Semitism fades to some extent? This is one answer. I would only add to that that the uh, perhaps the most striking difference is that Brandeis from the beginning wanted to be a place for everybody. Of course, it primarily attracted Jews um, who were fearful of uh, not being accepted elsewhere. But from the beginning, there was the sense that this was a place that everybody could be at home, where there was not supposed to be any racial discrimination and not just uh, an, uh, the absence of anti-Semitism. Whereas the historically black colleges and universities, and I, I taught at one of them for two years before entering at uh, Brandeis in graduate school, they had an entirely different function and very different mission. It wasn't particularly to promote pluralism, not to promote diversity, but really to be a place where um, virtually only blacks would be able to attend, uh, in which increasingly interest in black studies, black history would become possible but without any sense that it was intended to be inclusive in a way that Brandeis University uh, uh, has been, uh, has sought to be. And I'd say, let me add one last thing. I mean, I think in terms of the Brandeis part, uh, I, in my estimation, one of the great things about the Jewish tradition is its encouragement of fierce intellectual debate about everything. Uh, and anyone who is a little bit religious has been exposed to this. Uh, even the most holiest of texts is constantly uh, kind of parsed and reinterpreted. And I think there is, a, after reading Steve's book, uh, it's not simply a history of the left at Brandeis, but how the institution kind of nurtured space for even those on the left who are outside the mainstream, encourage students to be exposed to these ideas, encourage them to debate. It wasn't simply, here's the ideas of the left, but listen, debate, analyze, digest. And I think in, in many ways, that's, it's a very, that's how it's a very Jewish culture at Brandeis. That was my experience. And it's, a, it's another really a good contribution of the university that I hope continues. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. Um, so this one, um, can you please talk a bit more about Polly Murray and impact on Brandeis? Uh, yes, Polly Murray uh, had among the most extraordinary careers of anybody that is described in the book. Uh, she was from Durham, North Carolina. Uh, she was only part black. She was part white, part Native American. Uh, her sexual identity was um, was ambiguous uh, for much of her life. She always felt uh, to be an outsider, but always felt, as she remarked in her motto, whenever somebody tries to keep me out, I want to enlarge the circle that will include me in. Uh, um, very gifted as an attorney, um, did an important compilation of Jim Crow laws that uh, Thurgood Marshall relied on and had multiple copies in his office at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Um, her first full-time academic job, and it turned out to be her only full-time academic job, was at Brandeis beginning in 1968. She left in 1973 um, and having earned three law degrees, um, having been a founder of the National or organization for women, having been deeply involved in the feminist movement as well as in the anti-racist movement. And then um, uh, around the time that she left Brandeis, she decided to become an Episcopalian priest, which is the first, uh, was in the first graduating class of, um, for the priesthood that included women. Uh, and um, uh, posthumously, the Episcopalian Church declared her to be a saint. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, 
She's the only Brandeis faculty member that has ever been declared to be a saint. Uh, the Episcopalian Church defines sainthood in terms of an exemplary life rather than uh, divine intervention. Um, and um, uh, a, 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 a dormitory uh, at Yale is now named in her memory. Uh, so she's had a remarkable uh, posthumous career and reputation um, that is, uh, is fully deserved. And it's a shame that she's no longer alive to uh, acknowledge the recognition that she's been given in several biographies. There's a new one that has recently come out. Thank you. And our final question. You mentioned that you made a conscious decision not to write yourself into the book, but if you had, where would you fit in? <laughs> well, I was very close to two faculty members, John Roach, who directed my dissertation in the Department of History, and Larry Fuchs, Fuchs, who was my colleague and uh, closest friend in the Department of American Studies. And uh, the account given in the book of uh, John Roach's career and of Larry Fuchs's career, I think are colored implicitly by many conversations with both gentlemen. Um, but I, I didn't feel since my relationship to many of these people was minimal or non-existent, erratic or brief, I didn't feel there was any particular purpose in injecting myself. Uh, the ideal would be for me as a writer is if nobody can have any idea in reading the book whether I knew any of these people. Um, and um, it's, a, it's basically a way of saying the book is really about Brandeis. I mentioned in the acknowledgments, it's a kind of thank you note to Brandeis. Um, and that um, it's a way of really paying tribute to the kind of education that I personally got, the kind of education that I have uh, myself learned from students, and the ways in which uh, the university continues to be an, a very, very important uh, uh, feature of American higher education. Great. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you, Julian. I, I think this could have easily gone on for another couple of hours. <laughs> I have so much to talk about. And thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. We will be sharing a recording of this in approximately a week. Um, in the meantime, if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, you can go to the Brandeis University Press website, which is brandeis.edu forward slash press. We hope to see you at other upcoming events. Continue to check your email, look at our website and at social media. Um, thank you again for joining us. And to our fellow Brandesians in the Western states and along the West Coast, we're thinking of you and stay safe. Um, from those of us on the East Coast, have a good night. Thank you. Okay.